Hibernation 19. Grizzly's Growls presents Stories from a Hibernation. A Handy Guide for Beggars, especially those of the Poetic Fraternity, by Rachel Lindsay. Part 2 A Mendicant Pilgrimage in the East. Near Shikshini, the story of the hospitality of a promising family in a coal mining region. Part 2 The Son of King Coal Some spick and span people came out on the porch of the last house. Possibly they could understand English. Well, I went closer. They were out and out Americans. So I looked him in the eye and said, I would like to have you entertain me tonight. I am sort of a begging preacher. I do not take money, only food and lodging. A begging preacher? Well, my sermon is poetry. I can read it to you after supper, if that'll suit. Well, what sort of poetry? asked the man. I can only say it is my own. Well, I just love poetry, said the woman. Come in. Come on up said the man, and hustled out a chair. I'll go right in and get supper, said the wife. She was a breezy creature with a loud, musical voice. She doubtless developed it by trying to talk against giant powder. I told the man my story, in brief. After quite a smoke, he said, So, you walked here from Wilkes Bar this afternoon. Why, man, that's that's seventeen miles. I do not believe it was over fourteen. He continued, I'm awful glad to see a white man. Now, this place is full of bohunks and slavs and Russians and Poles and licorices, Lithuanians. They're not bad to have around, but they ain't Caucasians. They all talk Italian. Well, the fellows rather breathe not only race fraternity, but industrial fraternity. It had no suggestion of sheltered agricultural caution. It was sophisticated and anti-capitalistic. It said, You and I are against the system. That's enough for brotherhood. Well, now that he stood and refilled his pipe from a tobacco box nailed just inside the door, I saw him as in a picture frame. He had powerful but slanting shoulders. He was so tall he must needs stoop to avoid the lintel. With his bent neck he looked as though he could hold up a mine caving in. His general outline seemed to be hewn from fence rails and then hung with grotesque muscles of loose leather. His eyebrows were grown together. And from looking down long passageways his eyes were marvelously owl-like. He was cadaverous. He had a beak nose, he had a retreating chin, but breaking the rules of phrenology, he managed to convey the impression of a driving personality. He looked like an enormous pickaxe. He calmly commented, well, them Polacks waste powder awful, not only on Sunday for fun, but down in the mine they use twice too much. Can't blast the hardest coal either. And they're always getting careless and blowing themselves to hell and everybody else. It's awful, it's awful, he said in a most philosophic tone. He lowered his voice and pointed with his pipe stem. Now, them people that live in the next house are supposed to be Caucasians, but they haven't got a marriage license. They let their little girl go for beer this afternoon for them uh, fellas exploding powder over there. They ain't no way to raise a child that... Child's mother was a well-behaved Methodist till she married a Polak and had four children, and then he died, and they died, and some say she poisoned them all. Now, now she's got this child by this no-account white man. They live without a license like birds, yet they eat off weddings. They eat off weddings? Well, yes, uh, these bohunks and licorices all have one kind of a wedding. Last three days, and... Everybody comes. Best man is king. He bosses the plates. Bosses the plates. Well, yeah, they they buy a lot of cheap plates. Every man that comes must break a plate with a dollar. Plates put in the middle of the floor. He stands over it and bangs the dollar down. If he breaks the plate, 
he gets to kiss and hug the bride. If he doesn't break it, the young couple get that dollar. He must keep on giving them dollars in this way till he breaks the plate. Eats and plates and beer cost about $50. Young folks clear about $200 to start life on. And, he continued, the folks next door make a practice of eating round at weddings without putting down their dollars. I began to feel guilty. Well, it's a good deal uh, like my begging supper and breakfast of you. But he hadn't meant it that way. No, you're taking the only way to see the country. Well, man, I used to travel like you before I was married. Except I didn't take no book nor poetry or nothing. I wasn't a fear to boxcars the way you are. I've been in every state in the Union but Maine. I don't know how I kept out of there. I've been nine years in this house. I don't know what I see as much as when I was on the go. Now, that fellow Gallic over there that was shooting a pistol at the sky, he killed a man named Bothwinis last year, got off scot-free. It was Gallic's wedding. Bothwinis bought $50, and he was going to break all the plates in the house. Used up $12. Broke seven plates. Kissed the bride seven times. And then the bride got drunk. She was only 15 years old. She hunted up Bothwinis and kissed him and cried. And Gallic chased him down toward Shikshini and tripped him up. Shot him in the mouth and in the eye. Bride didn't know no better. He was an awful sight when they brought him in. The bride was only a kid. Now these bohonk women never learn no sense anyway. They're not smart like Caucasian women. And they fade in the face quick. And he reflected, My wife's a wonderful woman. I've been here with her nine years. She learns me something every day, and she still looks good in her Sunday clothes. He became lighter in tone again. And what these bohunks need is a priest and a church to make them behave. They mind a priest some if he's a good priest. They're all Catholics or, or no church. Seems though so sometimes a man's got to shoot. Some of them devils over there used to throw rocks at my door, but one Sunday I filled them full of buckshot, and they quit. The justice upheld me. Didn't have to pay no fine. They've been pretty good neighbors since. Pretty good neighbors. There was a sound as though the flagstones of eternity had been ripped up. He saw I didn't like it and said consolingly, Ah, they'll stop and go to supper pretty soon. They ain't too much to do anything but said afterwards. Don't have nothing to eat in the old country but raw turnips. Here they stuff themselves like toads. I don't see how they save money the way they do. Mine owners squeeze the very life out of them and they wallow in beer. I've always made big money. Somehow I never kept it. Me and my wife are spenders, but I ain't afraid. I'm the only man on the street that can dig the hardest coal. I could dig my way out of hell with my pick and by gosh, I once I did it too. Well, the wife came to the door, newly decked in an elaborate lace waist, torn at last at the shoulder. Husband was right. She looked good. She announced radiantly, Come to supper. Well, then she rushed down between the houses and shouted, Jimmy and Frank, come down here. What you doing? Get down off that roof. What you doing associating with them Polak children? What you doing with them switches? And she swore heartily as unto the Lord and continued, they're helping them Polak kids switch that poor little drunk American child. Come down off that coal shed. Well, they slunk into sight. She snatched their switches from them. Who started it? Well, Jimmy admitted he started it. He looked capable of starting most anything, good or bad. He had eyes like black diamonds, a stocky frame, and the tiny beginnings of his mother's voice. I don't know whether to lick you or not, she said judicially. Finally. Oh, go up to bed without supper. Jimmy went. She addressed us in perfect good humor as a musical volcano might. Come and eat. Part 3 The Daughter of the King Never did I see a beefsteak so thick. There was a garnish of fried onions. There was a separate sea of gravy. There was a hill of butter, a hill of thickly sliced bread. There was a delectable mountain of potatoes. That was all. 
These people were living the simple life, living it in chunks. At table, as everywhere, the husband solemnly deferred to the wife. She was to him a druid priestess, and so she was radiant, as women enthroned are apt to be. Of course, no young lady from finishing school would have liked the way we tunneled and blasted our way through the provender. We were gloriously hungry, and our manners were a hearty confession of the fact. My passion for the joys of the table partially sated, I began to realize the room. There were hardly any comforts of home. There was a big onyx timepiece, chipped, not running. Beside it was a dollar alarm clock in good trim. There were, in the next room, among other things, two frail gilt parlor chairs, almost black. The curtains were streaked with soot and poorly ironed. She said she had washed them yesterday, but she continued, I just keep cheerful. I don't keep house. Don't seem like I can. The street is so awful dirty and noisy and foreign. Yet you like it, said the husband. Well, yes, that is because I'm half Irish. The Irish were born for excitement. What's your ancestry? I asked the husband. Well, my father was a mountain white, moved, down, moved here from North Carolina, dug coal, and married a Pennsylvania Dutch lady. It's your turn, she said to me. You're a preacher? Well, that's kind of an excuse I make. You can't be any worse than the preacher we had here, continued the wife. He lived uh, down toward Shikshini, preached in an old chapel, wouldn't start a Sunday school. We, need, we needed one bad enough. He just married folks, hardly ever buried them. They say he was afraid. And, she continued with a growing tone of condemnation, it's a preacher's business to face death. At just about the time two of our children died of diphtheria when, was when he came to these parts. He was a Presbyterian, and I was raised Presbyterian, and he wouldn't preach the funeral of my two babies. He promised to come. We waited two hours. So I just read the Bible at the grave. This she recounted with a bitter sense of insult. And the same day he locked up his mother, too. Locked up his mother? Well, yes, some said he wanted to visit a woman he didn't want her to know about. They said he was afraid she would follow him and spy. He locked up the old lady, and she bought yelled the roof off, and the neighbors let her out. And then, continued my hostess, when he was dying, he sent for a Wilkes Bar priest. He sent for a priest, I exclaimed, completely mystified. Well, yes. He must have been a Catholic all the time, and the priest wouldn't come either. That's what that old preacher got for being so mean. She continued, That preacher wasn't much meaner than the man in the company store. She was bristling again. He won't deliver goods up here unless you run a big bill. If I want anything much well, big Frank here is at work, I have to take Jimmy's little play express wagon and haul it up. Now she was telling me of her terrible fright three days ago down at the company store when there was a Rumor of an accident in one of the far tunnels of the mine. All the foreign women come running down the hill, half crazy. I'm used to false alarms, but I could hardly get up to this house with my goods. I was expecting to see Big Frank brought in just like he was before Little Frank was born eight years ago. Little Frank lifted his face from its business of eating to listen. The first thing that boy ever saw was his father on the floor there, covered with blood. You don't remember it, Frank. "'asked his father, grinning. "'Nope.' "'The wife continued. "'There was only one doctor, Kane. "'We had a time between us. "'Other doctor was tending the men "'husband had dug out. "'Coal fell on them and mashed them flat. "'Couldn't quite mash husband. "'He's be too tough,' she said lovingly. "'He grabbed his pick and he tunneled his way through "'with blood squirting out of him. "'Husband grinned like a petted child. "'He said, well, it wasn't quite bad as that, but I was bloody all right. She continued with a gesture of impatience. Ah, oh, this is cheerful Sunday night talk. Let's try something else. And what kind of a poem are you going to read? Well, it tells boys how to be great men, but it's for fellows from 15 to 20. Have to save it for your sons till they grow a bit. She was at the foot of the stair like a flash. Son, dress and come down to supper. 
Son was down almost as soon as she was in their chair, p- pulling on a stocking as he came, and he was hungry. He ate while we talked on and on. Thanks for listening to Stories from the Hibernation. Comment on the website at grizzly.libsyn.com. This program is sponsored by donations from people like you and is released with a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.